cloud. Looks like it's doing that. Double check. Recording. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Good. Oh, perfect. Gotta go back. To touch. There we go. Okay. 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 Um, well, I just I just want to first. Right. You're gonna do the, you do the welcome. You do what you got to do for sure. Perfect. Thank you. I, uh, I, I'll I make it brief. I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. This is the first of four uh, presentations on, um, on our series Mental Health Matters. Um, we have four incredible presenters and we want to thank uh, George Papa George for um, kickstarting us off. Uh, but before we, we jump into it, if, um, if Father Pizzotiris is here, I think he's the uh, senior clergy in the Zoom call. If Father Pete, if you don't mind uh, starting us off with a prayer. I don't mind, but that that's weird to be a senior clergyman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have we have young clergy in our metropolis, my friend. Don't feel yeah. too bad. Yes, yeah. comparatively yeah. speaking. Very young, very young. Okay. It, it only gets weirder. Just, just know that much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ our God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to hear about mental health, to uh, grow in our faith, and simultaneously to be able to deal with constructively in a healthy manner with stress, anxiety, and all the challenges before us, especially during these times. We ask that you bless us and our presenter, George, uh, and that we may, again, learn from him uh, how to cope with all the stresses in our life Listen. And, and also for our families and loved ones. We ask for this in your holy name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, Father Pete. Um, I, uh, first of all, I wanted to start off by saying uh, thank you to the um, different parishes that are, are being represented tonight. Resurrection, Castro Valley, St. Basil's in Stockton, Holy Apostles in Washington, St. Catharines in Arizona, and St. Demetrius in Concord, and anybody else uh, who's joining us. I know we have some people from the East Coast as well, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this, this whole uh, initiative started just with the realization that, uh, you know, there's, there's so much information going out there. There's so much happening in our country. Uh, people are working longer hours. People are, are taking care of other people. They're taking care of themselves, and uh, suffice it to say that uh, it's a little overwhelming and it's taking a toll on people's mental health. That's not just my opinion, that is uh, everyone's professional opinion across the board. So we thought that it would be great if um, we can just provide as many avenues for people to check in, uh, especially from a, a church perspective, and, um, and hear a little bit about you know, what's available, uh, how can we maybe shift our thinking, um, just, to, just to, to gain as much health, mental health as possible. Um, so with that said, before, before we introduce George, uh, please make sure that your Zoom call is muted so that we don't have any unnecessary noises throughout the, uh, the presentation. Um, and uh, with that said, we, we, we want to introduce uh, Mr. George Papa George, who is a marriage and family therapist. And uh, you're, he's probably very familiar. If, you're, if, you, if you've been around the Metropolis for a little while, you probably are familiar with, uh, with George. He is... Um, a wonderful presenter and, uh, and an incredible resource to our metropolis, to our archdiocese. And uh, we are very indebted for him for speaking tonight and for helping to put this um, entire presentation and speaking series together. Um, he, he's always very generous, very kind and patient. And, um, and Mr. Papa George, thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to the presentation. All right, awesome. Thank you, Father Michael. and. Um... I remember meeting, talking about this. We actually sat at a restaurant doing that in the good old days. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be with you guys. And, um, and I, you know, I, I'm to start out, just really thankful uh, to have this opportunity. Father Pete and I were, you know, kind of joking a minute ago about the opportunity I had out in Stockton and, you know, um, Father Nico's here. And, you know, I know a bunch of folks from Resurrection and, um, and then there's folks, you know, from Washington, know a bunch of them. So I'm, I'm delighted that I'm kind of the Forrest Gump of orthodoxy, like how I even get to know all these great people, lucky me. Uh, so, and then also just in the Zoom world, which there's been a lot of disadvantages, a lot of advantages, it's kind of cool that we can connect. I sometimes have a little bit of issue, so I'm just going to like speak to it just to say, 
I would love to be with you guys in person. So sometimes just being on the other side of the screen, um, I just want to make sure I'm remembering that I'm with you guys and you're with me. And uh, without that connection, you know, it, I don't, I don't have much to say. And if I have that connection, then I, then I want to share from my heart. So, um, so whatever way I can to start from my heart to, to get to your heart. Our target on mental health appropriately goes into our title, which is we are what we think. In fact, I saw a bumper sticker the other day I totally liked, and it said, don't believe everything you think. And it was very, very insightful because in the world of our thinking, and it's going to be our focus tonight, that if, if we had only one thing to consider when it comes to mental illness and mental health, and we got clearer on this whole issue around what does our thinking do and what does my thinking do? And that you'd be a student of yourself. What does your thinking do? If you've ever, uh, it's a kind of strange analogy, but if we were ever to encounter someone that grew up in air pollution and we'd, call, we'd ask them, what do you call it? They'd call it air. It's what they know. Our thinking is the same way, that if we have some issues with our thinking, we're not going to necessarily know it's polluted or that it's distorted. It's just the way we think. And so we're going to take hopefully a practical look at, uh, and we have um, Elder Thaddeus there with a great book entitled, uh, coin his phrase, that our thoughts determine our lives. So we're really going to take a practical look at, do we have insights on how we think? Because if we get a, some clarity on how we think, we're going to really have some explanation on why we end up having the emotions we do and why we end up having the behaviors we do. I would say just from the outset, research would say that almost 100% of our emotions, sad, mad, glad, anxious, almost 100% of our emotions come from the way we just thought about something. So typically what we find, kind of like the air pollution, typically what we find is that a distorted negative thought leads to an inflamed, painful feeling. So we're going to put those pieces together so we could better understand how, how true it is that we are what we think. Before we get into all that, um, just to help me get in my heart so I could share it with you, um, I do like to share my kids with you. We have Petros there and Olivia. Olivia is a footingy. And... Um, uh, Olivia is five years older than Petros, and uh, and they're the delight of the century. And if you, you've seen, you know, you've seen me do PowerPoints before, you know I do that right there. And there's Olivia and Petros right there. And I love to trip myself out. Okay, boom, boom. That is my flashback world. That's how fast it goes. There they are. Here they are. And now Olivia's 23, graduated from the University of Colorado Boulder, and Petros is 18, uh, senior at Monta Vista High in Danville just got accepted, found out a week ago, to its first pick of a college, which is University of Colorado Boulder. So back we go. He's a snowboarder. He can't wait to get into those Rocky Mountains. All that said, um, I'm reminded of my family that I'm really reminded of how mental health matters. Sometimes we can even skip on how we feel about ourselves or how it's going for us. We think about those we love the most, nearest to our heart, we really get reminded this stuff matters and how do, how do we understand mental health and generationally, how do we understand it such that we pass on health instead of illness. And so we keep our families in mind, we keep our own hearts in mind. And so I ask you guys, you know, how, how are you? Uh, and certainly I want to just validate and connect with however you're showing up tonight. I'm glad you're here. Um, what's going on for you really does matter. And uh, a few of you, certainly clergy, know this little story that I share because uh, I shared it at Clergy Lady Conference. But in that question of how are you, it's a question we often ask ourselves and ask one another, and it's a common greeting. And I hearken back, if I could share this quick little story, back to what I think is about 1968. Uh, so I was in about second grade, and um, and I grew up in the fog of San Francisco in Daly City, and um, but we had a little place like every Greek, they found a place to plant their tomatoes and their grapes. And so my dad bought a, an acre out in uh, Sonoma and uh, we'd cross that Golden Gate Bridge with the windows up, get on the other side of the bridge, windows come down. We'd see the sunshine for the first time in weeks. And then we'd head to Sonoma and have kind of our, our little country life. And uh, 
so we had our own, you know, sort of our country life out there. And so I'm hearkening back to this one memory that deals with this exact question of how are you? And we were driving down our street after a long weekend together as a family. I'm the young, youngest of five and we all five kids in the 56 Buick, our, our dog. Uh, my parents sat in the front and he, my dad, we were heading down our street and he slowed down because we saw our neighbor. Was, the street was filled with Greeks and Italians. And uh, one of our Greek neighbors, Mrs. Zuzunis, uh, was uh, walking his sheepdog, and also his wife was on the other side, and they were walking slowly, and they were older than my parents. My dad slowed down, rolled down the window of the 56 Buick, and uh, was, kala, 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 kala. how are you, how are you, fine, 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 fine. Kala, 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 kala. You know, all that back and forth, and everything was super happy, and at eight years old, and I don't know how I lucked out, but I had had a window seat, which when you're the fifth born, you often do not get window seats in the back of that 56 Buick. I had a window seat, though, and why that's notable is because I was I was close to the window and closest to my dad. And a, after all this banter of the guys, the guys, how are you? How are you? Fine, fine, fine. I saw something happen that just is etched in my little memory, and this memory hadn't come back until like last year. And it simply was the simple question that had already been asked: How are you? And after all the fine, fine, fine happened, my dad leaned out the window a little, and Mr. Zuzunas leaned in the window a little, and my dad very softly used the very same words, but said, how are you? Already it was, how are you, how are you, fine, fine, fine. And now it was, how are you? And softly, I heard something that, like, it was a little freeze frame. I, it was a moment in time, and Mr. Zuzunas had then said the real answer. I was, health was failing, and then he wasn't so okay. And I remember at that moment thinking, I just heard something. I just, I noticed something. But there's distinctly two different how are you's. And in a way, we could say those are two different approaches to our life, two different approaches to our relationship. And very often, we do the, the how are you number one, and we don't always tune in to how are you, number two? Certainly for our time tonight and this whole series, we're really trying to tune into how are you, number two. And so when we think about that, we look at this. Um, oops, I'm not sure where the slide went. Okay. Um, we have how are you, number one? How are you, number two? How are you, number one, was more of a drive-by. How are you, number two, was more of a lean-in. I want us to think about our relationships that way. I want us to think about our interactions that way, how much we could fall into a drive-by relationship, a drive-by how are you, a drive-by time with a friend or with a family member, or what does the lean-in look like and sound like? Might use the same word, have a whole different experience. And so we see drive-by how are you, the first how are you, how are you? There's no connection required. And even as I'm just putting out the slides and we get into a lot of material in a minute, but I just want us to think about this just fundamentally. It's a Christian tree. And so we see that um, no connections required if we do that, that kind of approach to relationships. And if we could say it this way, no inner life is called upon. There is a, um, and in fact, in some ways, because Mrs. Zuna said, fine, 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 when it wasn't really accurate, we could even say the drive-by approach to relationships, reality is not even required. We can just give an answer that is this good sounding answer and not really dig in down deep, inner life, not required, connection not required, reality not required, more of go through the motions. And the how are you of leaning in is connection is cultivated, that my inner life connects with your inner life. And there was something I saw that day in my dad and Mr. Zazunas that, that I just saw a, friend, a real friendship take place in the quiet how are you, in the leaning in, in the giving the real answer. And so I want us to take this kind of foundationally to say, sometimes when it even comes to mental health, there's a real big wellness difference between if I'm doing my life in a drive-by kind of way, go through the motions, give all the answers that I think are required, as opposed to a more vulnerable kind of life, a more transparent kind of relationship, where, where vulnerability occurs and I dig into my inner life. 
And so if we could take a look at this uh, famous painting of the Garden of Eden, we can see that a lot happened in what the scriptures call the fall of man. It kind of is the origins of mental illness. And I would say it's like living life without the inner life. If we think about doing the drive-by, not access the inner life, not access the authentic person within, we think about our personal life, our parenting life, our married life, our parish life, all of which we could do without going into our heart, that the enemy, the serpent himself, the devil, would, would in a way present that original sin as trying to be like God without God, trying to have life without that source of life. We can call it the big lie. What ends up happening is when we try to do life without the life giver, then it's that battle between finding God's will versus self-will. And so the temptation would be, and maybe even modern life, lures us into trying to do to leapfrog over our inner life, leapfrog with, with what's really going on inside. And when we ignore the inner life, it begins to die. And when it dies, it doesn't get cultivated. When it doesn't get cultivated, it gets distorted. And we're going to tonight, in the next few minutes, look at what happens with these distortions within. And this is how we understand our thought life. And so what happened with Adam and Eve? One of the first things that happened with Adam and Eve is they hid. They, they, they disconnected from God, and they thought they could hide from God. And God said, you know, Adam, where are you? Not as if God didn't know, but it, more appropriately, Adam didn't know where he was anymore. He had disconnected from God. It wasn't one of the first things he did. He says, it's that woman you gave me. Blame enters the relationship. Merit, marital problems started in the Garden of Eden. We see that the trying to do life without the inner life, having our inner life not connect with the inner life of God, compromises our relationships. And we go from just answering a question of where we are or how we are into having all these hiding kinds of answers of blaming and anything wrong with me isn't about me, it's about someone else. And so I want us just to pause there to say that when we have distortions in our thoughts, when we have some scrambling, some hurting going on the inside, it often will get evidence in how we do our relationships on the outside. And so what we're going to try to do here, and hopefully it could work just from a technology perspective, I'd like you to just listen. Brene Brown's one of my favorite psychologists out of Houston, Texas. Uh, she has really good work, great audio books you can listen to. Um, and let's take a look and a listen at what she says uh, about what happens in, with blame in our relationships. George, are you able to maybe turn her volume up? Ooh, yeah. Okay. That help. Can't hear. Not, not really. Is it good or bad? No, I still no. It's we still can't hear. Don't hear it okay. at all. Okay, hold on. Um, it probably is in the computer. I'm guessing. I remember dealing with it, it, Father Pete's. We had to deal with this. <laughs> uh, we, we remember. I don't know if you remember that Father Pete. We had to get uh, Matthew. And I had to get in the computer somehow. Um, so if you if you click share computer volume, I'm being told. Would that be under more? Let me put that back just in case we're able to do in the that. share in the share settings. Um, I've got new share or I've got more and and. Uh, let me just go more and see if there's any. Share sound. So what I share okay, sound. so I hear. If you look in the share. chat, Melissa is letting us know stop share first. We stop the share and then we click share screen. It's an option. So okay. first we stop cool. the sharing and then we and then we. How do you stop the share? 
Um, share. Okay. I, I click your eat. screen. I, uh, let me have to bypass it, but um, I've got share at the share sound at the bottom of that screen. Okay. Try that. Optimize, optimize video clip. Should I also click that? I don't see that. Maybe just share sound. Now, can, can you hear me talking still? Yeah. Okay, let's, let me just see. If, tell me if you hear anything right away here. <gasps> hear yep. anything? There we go. Perfect. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house. I have on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this. Damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who is my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, do, like dial tone. Because <laughs> he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming... This is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the no, 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 no thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening we're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. All righty. Now, how do I get us back? Do I say stop share? Okay. Whoop. Hello. Oops, Hello. I got to I got to share again. Okay, sorry for the I'm high touch, low tech. So share screen. There. There. There we go. All righty. We back on board there. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, cool. Um so even as we're looking at that video, uh we're seeing this ripple effect when something is not happening healthy on the inside something is not going to ha happen healthy on the outside and that the tendency even from the back back to adam and eve is instead of dealing with 
something that's troubling me on the inside, it's a lot easier to have 20-20 vision to find what's wrong with someone else on the outside, what we call blame. So very often when we do have relationship problems, it can give us a clue of what's going on in the depth of who I am. So much so tonight that the depth of who we are even boils right down to how we think. How's my thinking showing up? So we go right into what I call insights from sports psychology, where we go into the head and the heart. And it, for any athletes out there, if you watch sports, you know there's a figure of speech that's really well known in, in professional sports, which is the worst curse you could a professional athlete could ever have is this whole idea of when they get into their head too much, right? You've heard, you've heard that said, and the athlete has every bit of talent, head to toe, stacked head to toe, and the one thing that would be like the kryptonite, you, could, you know, you could see interviews with professional athletes. The kryptonite is, oh, no, I, I did it. What would you do? I got into my head. And so just pause the button right there. That could describe our life. That when we get into our head too much, it messes with our game. And I want us just to take a breath in a way to say, how does my how do my relationships work? How, what goes on for me? That if 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 your game isn't going very well, it could very well be that you like professional athletes get into your head too much. There's a guy named Chuck Knobloch. Now we can have just scores of examples of true life story to professional athletes. One that was in my generation was a guy that was a, a professional baseball player, Minnesota Twins. He went to the Yankees. He was a golden glove second baseman, which means he was one of the best professional infielders in the game up until a certain day that he was fielding a grounder. He let it go too high. It sailed into the crowd and hit someone's mother in the head. It rattled him so much that every time after that there was a grounder, he then got into his head and was worried that he would make an error. Prior to that, a grounder is this thing he enjoyed. He showed up to the grounder, and all he had to do was show up to it. Everything worked out. As soon as he got into his head, what happened? He started worrying about outcome, left the present moment. And the story of Chuck Knobloch is very tragic because he went on to, I think, throw like 20 more balls into the, into the stands, such oh. that when it kept happening, he left the field. So the ending was over, left the field, and ultimately left the game. And then years went by, and he was arrested for domestic violence and all this kind of stuff, and we'd say, what a tragic story of a Golden Glove professional athlete who got into his head, and, and when we, so we think about this in my, in my head or in my heart, a lot of what the church teaches is really kind of takes us into that reflection. Life in the head, life in the heart. Now, what's life in the head? Well, we're pretty familiar with it. What's true about life in the head? Overthinking. Obsessive thinking. So we know the word obsessive, a little bit different than compulsive. So obsessive is repeated thoughts. Compulsive is repeated behavior. So life in our head leads to obsessive thinking. Typically, what kinds of things are we overthinking? Well, much, much like Chuck Knobloch, we aren't thinking about our golden glove and how good that felt. We're thinking about the error we made, and we can't believe how awful we are. We fall into, I'm an awful person, defined by, 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 that, by, that, uh, by that error. So we have overthinking. We have obsessive thinking. We focus on outcome. In therapy, we call it future tripping. Now, just this list alone starts, describe, starts describing kind of that line between mental wellness and mental illness. <clears throat> and we're all kind of in that spectrum every day. But even with just us tracking with, oops, I went in my head, something usually triggers it. I start my overthinking, or I might, depending on you, you, you might be a couple things on this list. You might be the whole list. You might be one thing on the list. But whatever it is, we all know we have our slippery slope. We focus on outcome. An athlete who focus on outcome stiffens up, and he's not, he's not present for the process. Now, it's something true about life in our head. <clears throat> and we could be talking about our personal life. We could be talking our, about our children here. 
we could be talking about our, our how we parent, and that is this idea of uh, worthiness. So when we're in our head, something flips on us. What flips? What flips is that our performance determines our worthiness. I'm only as good as my latest performance. My worth is only defined by what I just did. So if my worth is on the line, no wonder I'm going to be anxious about my next performance. Therefore, the time zone we're often in when life's in our head is either past or future. Chuck, Chuck Knobloch uh, attached himself to the pain of the past, and it took him out of the present, and it made him worry about the future. It causes what I call primal panic when that button is pushed when we're in our head, all kinds of stress hormones are being released. We could look up what cortisol does. It does all kinds of um, survival. Flight or fight. Uh, yeah, flight or fight or, 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 you know, three F words, flight, fight, or frozen. So take your pick. But all it is is we've left our humanity. We've left who we actually are and become this, this, this sort of rigid uh, a fearful, fear-filled person. Now, sometimes, like in our little video, we take the life in the head and what we call projection, and that is the discomfort we have on the inside, we make it about somebody else. That's the kind of the Houdini. Oh, yeah. Projection. We, slip, we, we slip out of something that we don't like the bad feeling, and we start making it about someone else because it's a lot less vulnerable to have a bad feeling about someone else than to have a bad feeling about ourselves. We'll wrap up this list just by saying cognitive distortions, which is just a therapy way of saying stinking thinking. Our, our, the cognitive means thinking. We have distortions in the way we think. This is what we come to find out that is plentiful, plentiful for us. This is not a, oh, I remember a day once I had a cognitive distortion. What often is more true is I remember the day that I actually had clear thinking. And I wasn't inundated with the distortions, if, if you will, the clogs in the filter. And so the visual and, and working with families and working with kids, I've, I've described it this way for years. And, and if we could look at our minds as, the, as like children on a playground. Now, think about your life, including your childhood, but also right now, your, your, your adult life. And you're thinking like, well, how does my thinking work? In what way is it distorted? In what way is it injured? In what way does it, does it get afflicted? In what way is there bondage around some of the ways I think? Well, if we, if we picture a little kid on a playground, and when I explain this to kids, I'll, I'll say, you know, hey, you know, you ever play on a playground? Yep. Okay, picture, picture that little kid on a playground, minding his own business. He just wants to have a little bit of fun out there. And unbeknownst to him, a bully shows up. A bully does one thing. A bully wants to make sure that little kid feels small and powerless. And the input from the bully is negative. Now, some bullies are just off the wall, and they'll just say wildly negative things that don't have any truth to them. Other bullies are crafty, and they'll take something that's partially true about the little kid and, and, and sort of beat the kid up about that little something that he knows about himself and just inflates it into some awful indictment on that child. And so we think about the playground of the mind. This is what we encounter every day. And so what we call mental bullies. Research would call it automatic negative thoughts. Sometimes we wake up with this dread and we're going, wow, where'd that feeling of dread come from? And often we have our own collection of mental bullies. The mental bully might say something like, you're going to, you're going to, you know, have an awful day. The mental bully might say something like, Oh, you're still fat. Or the mental bully might say something like you can't handle today, or your stress is going to get the best of you. Or you have that meeting later. They're probably going to see, you don't know what you're doing. The mental bully is crafty in all those ways. And so as we think about us encountering that, sometimes we are tired and we haven't even got out of bed yet, depending on that activity of, we are what we think. One of the saddest things that I've you know, dealt with children a lot and, and bullying initiatives and you know, school campuses and then there's cyber bullying and all that awful stuff. One of the worst things we know about bullying 
is when the one who's being bullied starts to believe what the bully says. So this is where our thoughts determine our lives. It is not uncommon for us in our own mental journey. It is not uncommon that we have already have our own collection of beliefs, negative beliefs that are toxic, that our mental bully has beat us up with for years. And we're trying to do life sort of the best we can with noises that people don't know about and voices people don't know about and awful battles that people don't know about in this world of our cognitive dimension of we are what we think. So we see that we kind of, in a way, go from the playground of the mind to the battleground and the battle for worthiness. And this idea of, and I would even say this back to the garden and Adam and Eve and the serpent and the work of the enemy. Because not only is the, the original sin skipping over our inner life where God connects with us and we connect with God and we try to be like God without God. But that original attack would be we forget where, where our sense of worthiness comes from. Interesting. And so anything to do with self-esteem, anything to do with self-doubt, anything to do with um, um, having inundation of these negative thoughts means we're, we're losing our sense of worthiness or our, our worthiness has been, has been attacked or has been uh, poisoned. And interesting to that, the word worthy is where we get the word worship. And so, the, you know, that original attack in the garden is to get away from our source of worthiness. We worship, we worship God because he is worthy and it's where we get the thumbprint of God and we have built in us this worthiness that is God-given worthiness. Made in the image and likeness of God, a beauty. And, you know, in the funeral service, it says, restore us to our original beauty. And my hope is we don't have to wait for our funeral to pray that. <laughs> That every day we say, Lord, help me to my original beauty, my sense of worthiness. Because the enemy, we see that, that, that slide there. The battle is happening in all kinds of invisible places and visible places that causes us to get distorted away from not really being in touch with our worthiness. And when the devil gets a hold of our worthiness and brings us down, then why not settle for that bad relationship? Why should I have that healthy boundary? Why eat well? Why live well? Because I'm not even worth it. We have a kind of a self-destructive track that we start to find when our worthiness is something we, we don't know we have the right to have. And so I've got this little book that you've seen. Some of you who know me know I read out this little book. Father Tom Hopko gave it to me, and it's the teaching of the Holy Fathers on the passions. And so what we see here, and I want to read a little bit, is that um, – it says, um, I am pursued, I say, by the enemy whose name is Legion, as wild as untold. Hapless wretch that I am, how should I hold myself victor when I'm being led away captive? It, it, quoting St. Jerome. Jerome's words tell us that the evil one, using a man's passions, destroys souls. So we see that the, the enemy on how the devil works is he uses a man's passions to destroy souls. Now, the word passions... Passion is in Latin, pathos in Greek. Pathos is where we get the word pathology. The enemy uses our pathologies to destroy souls. The enemy uses our distorted sense of our worthiness to bring us down. The enemy uses our scrambled thoughts about ourself, our negative thoughts about ourself that he's been hacking away at, like the big bully. He's been hacking away on us. Sometimes he's used other people to hack away on us. Either way, that idea of passion is this beautiful thing that got scrambled that causes us all kinds of distortion. And so if we think about a distorted thought is the thoughts that God has for us are beautiful and pure, and the enemy gets a hold of it, maybe somewhere in our life story where we took a hit and took a hit. But the enemy uses those distorted thoughts, uses a man's man's passions to destroy souls. And so I want to read this part really quick. It says the teaching of the Orthodox church fathers 
may be summarized by this parable. There was a city, there, in this city there was a courtesan, a word I never knew until I read this two years ago. A courtesan, anybody know what it is? Kind of like a super high priced, up there, high class, if you will, prostitute. In the city, there was a courtesan who had many lovers. The governor came to her and said, if you promise to be good, I'll marry you. She promised and the governor brought her to his home. But her former lovers said to each other, that ruler took her to his house. Ah, let's go to the back of the house and we're gonna whistle for her. Then when she recognizes the whistle, she'll come down. When she heard the whistle, she stopped her ears and withdrew to an inner chamber, shutting the door fast behind her. Abba John explains that the courtesan represents our soul. Her lovers are the passion. The governor is Christ. The inner chamber is the eternal dwelling. Those who whistled are the demons. Behold how this soul took refuge in the Lord. Now, we're not going to have a class on the passions tonight, but I want to just take that little nugget of a story and say that the enemy knows how our distorted thoughts given us appetites for all kinds of things. Why? Because we're drawn towards all kinds of things to almost like plug the hole that we have appetites for things that even in the uh, satisfying that ache inside causes all kinds of that toxic thinking leads to distorted behavior. And it doesn't just go away because we, we you know, graduated from sixth grade Sunday school. We realize that in our life story that this whistling goes on in the back door that we hear the, the, or the bully shows up on the playground and that our spiritual life can be understood as the one who takes refuge in the way of the Lord, but that we have that way of the Lord from the inside out with every thought that shows up, that we have that connection with knowing the difference between is this thought from the Lord or is it that familiar bully toxic thought? And so as we see even in the icon depicted from the parable of the Good Samaritan, we see that, and we don't have time to develop that whole story, but that, and, and you've heard me talk about that before, because for the family wellness ministry, this is kind of our, our iconic parable of our life journey, and unexpectedly we get stripped and left half dead, like the man in the ditch, and that God's work is to undo the work of the devil. Well, what's it mean to be stripped? Very often to be stripped it, in therapy terms, is we're left with shame. Guilt is, I feel bad about what I did. Shame is, I feel bad about who I am. Back to sports psychology, I just made an error. Now I feel awful about who I am. That's the stripped work of the enemy that the Lord wants to heal. What's the half dead? Like he left the man in the ditch half dead. What's the half dead? Very often the half dead, like you read in the little mini parable in the, in the little book on the passion, the half de dead is what we call compulsion. I feel awful on the inside. I find myself doing things that on the I'm telling myself there's no way I'm going to do it, and we do it anyway. What's half dead? I'm half um, alive enough to do it and half dead enough to not stop myself. So we have these struggles. You, you and I, I can say for myself, I have these struggles. And, it, and it, it, it goes all the way back to how is my thinking showing up today? How does my thinking contribute to the big lie? And how, or how does my thinking guide me toward truth and light? So St. Basil, and I love this, ever since I did the series out at, in Stockton at St. Basil, I actually got more connected with, with the saint. Um, oops. And it says, uh, and it, it, by the way, it's, it's, uh, this quote is the opening quote from a book called The Beginning, The Beginnings of a Life of Prayer. One of my favorite books of the last five years, The Beginnings of a Life of Prayer by uh, Irene, that Archimandrite Irene. Um, I think he's a bishop now, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but this quote is how he starts his whole book, and he says, be attentive to yourself. That is, observe yourself carefully from every side. Let the eye of your soul be sleepless to guard you. You walk in the midst of snares. Hidden traps have been set by the enemy in many places. 
Therefore, observe everything that you, you may be saved like a gazelle from traps and like a bird from snares. A great quote from St. Basil the Great. And so we see that life in the head, if we kind of can get a sense of back to our sports psychology, is how's your game going? When we get in our head, we get into our overthinking. When we get into our overthinking, that's the activity of the mental bullies. What we know about, you know, sort of deeper theology, we can say even the Louise Me, the studies on Louise Me, what the church fathers talk about, how dark it can get when we just stay in our head in trying to understand God and understand ourselves is there's no, as we said on our list of being in our head, we don't have a chance when we just stay in our head because we're either in the past in some pain or in the future in some fear. And so we transition to a quote from St. John Christome. When you find the gate to the heart, that's when you find the gate to the kingdom of heaven. This is where we have healthy psychology meets healthy theology meets wellness in so many ways. And that is our life is one that is from the heart. And that when we get to the heart, it's amazing how the kingdom is to be found. And so um, that journey to the heart, I have the little graphic there on Iron Man. And Father Tom Sagalaki, who's teaching next week, um, shared with me, and I cracked me up, and I've, I've said it ever since then, is he said, you know, he goes, George, you know, you know those stickers we have on the back of our cars, you know, 26.2, you know those Iron Man stickers, they ran an Iron Man, and 26.2, you know, is part of an Iron Man training, and it's, I think it's the length of how many miles of a marathon? And then they do swimming and they do biking and all this. Some of us do a half marathon, 13.1. And he says, the sticker we should have is 27 centimeters. What is 27 centimeters? It's the distance between the head and the heart. And so as we kind of just sit with our thoughts tonight, that this is the journey that uh, this series is wanting to invite you on, is this journey to your heart. And what do we find in our heart? Well, just we find that Life in the heart is life in the present moment. Life in the heart really does have a, a kind of a loving kind of self-acceptance. Like I gotta, I'm working with this right here. I don't have to have self-hate. Kind of, I'm good enough to be loved. We're not doing a parenting talk tonight, but if I was doing a parenting talk, I'd say the last 10 years of kids in this, in this particular generation has been sort of bitten by the serpent, if you will, of the not good enough. Best families, some great families, some not great families, almost doesn't matter. We're afflicted in, in, in a way that has been common since the Garden of Eden. But I'm finding in this particular generation, children are suffering with a distinct belief that they're not good enough. And so life in the heart is just that permission that, I'm, I, you know, I could be me, able to access joy. If you go into sports psychology, kind of you return to the joy of the game. You see the bigger picture. You don't obsess. You don't have narrow thinking. Focus on what is because life in the head, we always focus on what isn't, what we didn't do. Life in the heart is connected to the inner life. And then that in our spiritual connection with God, that is from our heart to his heart. And our relationships take on an absolute just paradigm shift because my ability to be connected to my inner life qualifies me to connect to the inner life of your inner life. And so I want to take a peek at this um, cool quote, and I put the, type, the, the book cover, another great book on my list in the last five years by Deacon Stephen Muse, Treasure in earthen vessels, prayer, and the embodied life. The treasure of the beloved Lord who has hidden himself in the last place we would look. And I want to just pause there. The, the Lord has hidden himself, and that always gets my attention. Why, why is he hiding himself? In the last place we look, yet the only place that we could be transformed, our own hearts. Isn't it interesting that just struck me the first time I read that? Like, gosh, isn't it just typical us that the last place we look is our own hearts? 
the pl last place we operate from is our own hearts. And so he goes on to say how we're meant, once we're in our own hearts, we're, it, it, it's confirmed by embracing him in each other's hearts and that we really find the path of our own heart. Um, and it, prayer isn't prayer unless it includes our neighbor and all of creation. So uh, right there, I just want us to think about our own path, our own day to day. And just think about that. Like, wow, with all the ways I'm just trying to get through it, maybe my heart is the last place I look. And yet maybe we can consider that that is the first place we go. We could almost think, develop a path, develop a practice, develop a prayer life that the heart is the first place we go and that we, we get back to, you know, Chris Holmes quote on when we find the gate to the heart, that's when we find the gate to the kingdom of heaven. So as we wrap this up and take questions in, in a few moments here, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I want to talk a little bit about what we understand in psychology and all the good stuff in what, what we're going to look at here in various therapies absolutely have roots in our church. As our church teaches that what's going on in our hearts is where we need to be directing our attention. I don't know if any of you have heard of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, super mainstream therapy. It saves people's lives in some cases. Why? Because cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is a therapy that really invites people to become a student of their thinking. And when you become a student of your thinking, and in cognitive behavioral therapy, you find, and the, and the the core of the teaching is that you might notice some kind of upset feeling and it gives you a whole list of finding out what feeling it is. I feel unworthy. I feel confused. I feel lonely. I feel like a failure. I feel sad. I feel aggravated. We get clear in our feeling and then it has us get a little clear on what might've triggered it. And so we kind of, start getting a little more clarity on what's going on. And certainly, and, and, and central to cognitive behavioral therapy, it takes us right to the center of the work, which is what negative belief did I buy into? And so we might walk in a room and, and someone, um, there's a group, you know, 10 feet away and they're laughing and we break out into a sweat and we're panicky. And we start having a panicky feeling. And we're like, I'm not even sure why I'm having this panicky feeling. Well, if we went back to our, what, what am I really believing? What's the distorted negative thought? It would be, we didn't ask for it, but it might be something like, oh, that laughter over there, they probably think I'm an idiot. I'm not good enough to go over there. They probably know something about me. That, well, that, in that example, that social anxiety. And yet, We'd say that distorted belief is the mental belief. That distorted belief is the culprit that then caused us to have the panic or caused us to have a, a social awkwardness. Because why? Because the poison of that negative belief. So cognitive behavioral therapy has become a student of that. Dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, is happening. It, they'd almost what, might as well use the Jesus prayer. Uh, what's going on, and this is more recent. I mean, they don't, but if I have anything to do with it. Um, but dialectical behavioral therapy is teaching clients basically how to meditate. Why? They find that you could teach all this good stuff to everyone, but once you, once you get triggered, you're in your head and it's hard to get out. So this is where we'd say, this is where our kitty eleisons come into play. This is where our prayer rope comes into play. This is where our practice comes into play, that when we get triggered in some way or feel unworthy or we're attaching, the mental bully is beating us up. This DBT really says, um, take the time to breathe, take the time to meditate, take the time to descend out of your head into a calmer place first. 
create a practice out of that. And then observe what that, that thought is telling you. You are not your thought. You are not your feeling. You get to observe your thoughts and feelings. We, in therapy, we call it the observing self, but very orthodox. And another way we could look at it would be back to the playground when we have a little graphic of the bully. And I, and I don't know if you actually had a, a experience in your childhood when you were bullied, if you had, you know, children coming home, your own children coming home, painfully describing them being bullied or what your exposure to that is. But if you could kind of picture that, we typically, you know, in the analogy we're using is that we can kind of picture the bully picking on a little kid and that we play both characters. So for our consideration, I want us to think about the third character on the playground. Sometimes there's the third character on the playground. And I want, to, I want us to consider being that third, learn how to be that third character. That's often the witness of the onlooker. The onlooker's seen this go on before and he's noticing it's happening right now. The big decision on the onlooker is will he become the advocate? Will he jump in? There's been heroic work by that third character on many a playground. And when that happens, we're so thankful because he sees what's going on. He knows it's not okay. Just out of pure empathy, he rushes over and stands alongside that little kid and reminds the little kid he doesn't have to believe the bully. Empowers the little kid that what the bully is saying is really about the sickness of the bully, not about anything about the heart and soul and, and well-being of that child on the, on the playground. So in a kind of therapy kind of imagery, if you will, if you've ever had, and, and even in our own life story, if you've ever, let's say, grown up with a critical parent, you know, you would never assign them as the bully. But if you had a critical parent, then give it enough years and you're now years into your adult life, you've internalized that internal critical parent. And it seems like something that's been nagging at you forever. So this, so this, this, this playground comes in different forms, shapes, and sizes. But this third character is this idea from a therapy perspective that would be, I've been here before, I'm identifying the bully, I'm going to learn how to be an advocate for that, if you will, kind of sounds therapy-ish, pardon me as I do that, but it's kind of how I think. But am I going to be there for the little boy inside of me who's getting beat up by that awful toxic thought? And for women, it would be that little girl inside that because something gets triggered, we're almost defenseless as a child. And will this other part of me be that onlooker that becomes the advocate? This turns into self-talk. This turns into, hold on, let's go get a cup of tea. Wait, let's get away from this. Let's not obsess over that. Let's get away from the mirror. Or let's get away from that email. Or let's take a minute for ourselves. Or, hey, let's do some breathing right now. That, that's the true friend is that advocate. But I also have on our list, and it's all simultaneous, if you will, whether we're talking CBT or DBT or we're talking about that imagery around picturing us coming along, alongside our own little boy or little girl, we'd also say, interestingly enough, in, in, in the, you know, John chapter 16, when, when the Holy Spirit, you know, there's the Holy Trinity, and when the Holy Spirit's getting introduced, it, you know, it's the, it's the parakaleo, the what, what's that translated as? The one who comes alongside. Interestingly, in the English translation, it sometimes it's translated, I'll give you a counselor. The Holy Trinity is the one who comes alongside. He's the third character on, on our playground. He's the one that, and interestingly, we have the Holy Trinity of, you know, we have, uh, you know, God the Father, you know, unseeable and expansive. We have God the Son, you know, who we connect to in the person and is Lord overall. And then we have God the Holy Spirit, and it says, who's with us and in us. So we have this advocate within us. We have the one who's called alongside that great counselor within us that really is meant to show up on the playground or on the battleground, wherever your battles take place in your thought life. We are not the sum total of our thoughts and feelings. We're a person. And the enemy wants to, you know, kind of basically deceive us that we have to be defined by our thoughts and feelings. And therefore, when we have a toxic thought or a toxic feeling, we believe that we're toxic. 
we're, we believe we're, we're, we're unworthy. I did note a few scriptures at the bottom that I'd, I'd love for you to write down or read because they really talk, they all talk about guarding our hearts. And I wouldn't mind that we would consider even asking ourselves what could be the use of scripture as part of my way that I guard my heart. If my heart grows up, it wakes up with toxic thoughts, what's it like if I give it medicine of truth and beauty and God being with me? Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So with that, I'm at, kind of at my official time there. I wanted to pause there and see if we could get any kind of discussion going, questions going, um, whether it be, you know, it, in whatever way, you know, as it connects to anything that came up for you or just this role of how it is that we deal with come alongside our own thought life and how it is that we can uh, find life from the heart that be, begins to connect with uh, the, sort of the, the life giver rather than the bullies all around. So again, in a Zoom format, but um, there's a way to unmute yourself and ask the question. <clears throat> if you know how to raise your hand on Zoom by clicking the reactions down below, uh, we can do that. Otherwise, um, just just go ahead and unmute yourself, and uh, and hopefully it won't get too chaotic. I have a question. Yeah. Curious, Elaine. <laughs> May I speak? Oh, oh yes, totally. Go right ahead. Um, do you believe that there are traumatic events like the the second baseman who threw and hit a woman yeah. that can be so traumatizing they uh, change your brain chemically? Right. So, so right. So the question is, what's the role of trauma? Um, in how we function and does it change the brain chemically? So I, I would say the short answer is yes. So I would say the, the role of trauma is more prevalent than we give it, give it credit, give it credence. Um, I think there's a lot of events that we wouldn't even know to call trauma that created trauma, that, that yanked us that shook us. And you know how we talked about head and heart? The orthodox vision is that we place our minds in our heart and that we're integrated. And these traumas pull us apart and we disconnect from our hearts. And so I think there's actual brain science that says that it can affect the way our brain functions and the kinds of signaling it sends out, affecting serotonin and so on. So this journey of what we do with our thinking, now on the flip side, I'd say what we do with our thinking starts building bridges back to higher ground. What we do with our thinking every day, there's a lot of medicine that actually can help our brain chemistry, neuro, neuro pathways and so on. So in our own journeys, some of us would, again, whether we know to call it trauma or not, We've been injured, and that's why the, even that parable of the Good Samaritan, we, you know, we've been injured on the journey. No one expected it, but we, 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 got, we got injured. And, and some of us can distinctly call it trauma. Others of us would say, oh, I got used to her talking to me that way or whatever that might be, a critical parent or so on, um, uh, or a beating or, a, or, or inappropriate sexual trauma. But, you know, one in six children experience sexual trauma um, in some way. So – so we just never know. It's like a minefield in a way where we don't know when those triggers are going to come up. And we just know that we lock down or we freak out or we start blaming or we start raging or we get depressed. And so uh, if we look at our thought life, that is almost like the most available path 
towards sanity every day. If we tend to our thinking every day, every moment sometimes, uh, and we connect what's going on in our thinking and get a bit of a vision that the Lord is the one who has beautiful, peaceful um, place for us in how to move toward self-acceptance and move toward being alive and rather than survival mode. And so sometimes the journey from our head to our heart is survival mode to living mode. Yes, thank you. Yeah. George, are you able to, um, uh, to leave share screen so that we can all see each other? Oh, let me see. Um, right. So I would be, uh, my tech people out there, I'd be, you are sharing screen. Oh, I could just turn off the, let's see, how do I get rid of my PowerPoint? I think if you just click share screen and then I should have a button that just says exit share screen. Or down at the bottom. At the bottom. There we go. Little um, green. As uh, uh, we'll, uh, just really quickly, if um, if anyone needs to leave, just know that uh, we'll be sending out an email with the with the link to the recording that will be on uh, YouTube for anyone else who wants to see the recording. Okay. Any other questions for George? I just want to say thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. Good. Right on. Uh, Oh, thank you. You're sweet, and it, it, you're 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 sweetie. And um, let me say too on the on the let let's keep in mind that what we do with our thought life has everything to do with confession. So our thought life sometimes talks us out of disclosing our suffering. Sometimes there's like I'll share my token things I can share, but not what's really going on inside. And so sometimes we keep the toxins in just because we're afraid. Also, what's going on with our thinking is how we want to find our people. We want to have relationships. By the way, we also want to have a parish that operates in a way that says, wow, you're thinking that, I'm thinking that too. You know, that we are invited into a safe space of healing when we recognize that we're afflicted by these mental bullies and that the, the, you know, and in a way, we start seeing it in the next generation uh, when we start seeing it crop up in our kids. And, and so uh, we just want to be attentive to life in the church, life with our relationships one, with one another is really meant to give us permission that the vulnerable struggle means you're being honest about your life and your heart and, you know, and that you want to, you know, that you, you can't be alone with it. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Really quick, when I was, my whole life growing up, my aunt would always say, stay out of your head. It's dangerous. Don't go in there alone. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Great advice. Great advice. Anyone else? And so, you know, as we're thinking of, in, you know, just jump in if you have a question, but let, let's keep in mind that Wherever you are in your journey, usually your own mental bullies have tried to, like, demote you, have tried to rip you off, have tried to limit you. So, as Michelle had said, don't, don't stay alone with that. Make sure that gets talked about out loud with someone safe. Let's share the journey. Because the enemy is crafty and the Lord has just got all the love. The Lord, you know, the Lord, you know, has all we need. Um, but sometimes we're in our skirmishes and we're not sort of going to the altar because we're getting beat up on the playground. And so we just want to be up. We just want to be open about it. Um, and that, you know, we don't we don't accidentally take the toxins in here and, you know, dump them on people around us. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What do you do with the person who 
is extremely annoying and is a bully and you try to calm them down and two or three of us may even um, approach them and they say, oh, you must be having a bad day. Why don't you sit down? And they just throw it back at you and never, ever accept that they're the ones that did it. Right. But isn't it interesting? I appreciate your question. Isn't it interesting that it, doesn't it stand out if we encounter people who don't take responsibility for their own toxic behavior? And is it interesting how good they are at blaming and projecting, deflecting? Yes. And isn't it kind of maddening in a way? It can be maddening. So this is what's, what's important in those moments because what we find is this is where we have to know our own heart and descend into our own heart. Uh, in, in codependency research, they call it detachment, which is the ability to still be connected to the person, but you're detaching from the toxins of that person. Mm. Hard work, but That's there is a really challenge. a thing. It's, no. a, it's a challenge. It's kind of a challenge that truly mm. defines our spiritual life because what's impossible for man is possible with God. Like this yeah. is, this would be, that's not a natural thing to do. We want to fight back or we never want to see him again. Um, but the supernatural would be knowing again, if we, the advocate comes along, helps the little girl inside of you or helps the little boy inside of me, it reminds me, okay, I'm dealing with that, this again. Uh, don't drink the poison. Also, this is where boundary setting comes in. What kind of boundary do I need to have with a person? And if I'm being mistreated, then I'm going to put a limit to what kind of time I have with that person. So there's kind of an internal boundary, which is like, I'm not drinking the poison. Their lips are moving and I'm not absorbing it. Or sometimes there's the external boundary, which is like so much for coffee with that person. And we have the right to say that person's not safe for me. Uh, so it varies, you know, from, from, you know, situation to situation, what we feel are, like our calling is. And that we, interestingly enough, and if we have a few priests here that, that would probably uh, affirm this, but that one of our greatest weapons, if you will, is to pray for the person because they're coming out with a fire hose of, of poison. And your prayer for them in your depth in your heart, A, helps you not personalize their sick behavior. Yes. Right? Which is important. And sometimes our own mental bullies cause us to personalize everybody's sick behavior. And we conclude, oh, must have been me, must have been me, must have been me. And so, um, but when we pray for the person, talk about a weapon, a, you know, kind of a cool, healthy weapon. Yeah. And that is, I'm not, I'm not personalizing it, and I'm keeping it in perspective that this is sickness coming out of the person. Yes. Uh, and I have to pray for them. I'm glad you made the advocate. Because one person made me so angry, I, I started writing the most horrible email you would think I never went to church and <laughs> I'm assuming and I, my bedroom, one entire wall is icons and the icon caught my eye. And I just, instead of, I erased the email and I prayed and I really felt the Holy Spirit told me, don't do this. And it wasn't even, you know, 15 minutes later that she phoned me and said, I was so wrong. And she apologized. And I thought, I'm so glad I didn't send that it's email. Yeah. Would have lost her forever. Yeah. yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, your icon saved the day. Good job. Mm -hmm. Well, it, and it's a great little testimonial too, right? Uh, and it's also, you got triggered. You were in fight or flight. Oh, yes. Right? And so yeah. even that for mental well-being and our thoughts determine our lives, if we're in our triggered thinking, we will do um, the behavior that goes with it. And so this is the tent. What's that? I wanted to put a hit on her. <laughs> right, exactly, right? Sopranos. And so, um, and, and so this is how we tend to our heart, though. We recognize my heart is hurting over that. Now, let me go take care of my heart. Enter in icon, enter in Christ, enter in, Lord, this is awful for me right now. We, get, we descend back into our heart. You know, I hardly knew what Kitty Leson meant when I was a teenager. I just knew that it was Kitty Leson, Kitty Leson, Kitty Leson. They, you know, say it a million times. You know, but when you really realize, like, wow, no wonder we pray for mercy so much. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. In all these moments, whether we're being beat up on the inside or we're being beat up on the outside, 
that we get into our heart and then we find the strength, we find the insight, we find the path, and we actually find the protection. Because when you lose a friend that you really loved and you acted rashly, your heart aches for them when you know you'll never be friends again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to protect your heart and theirs. Yeah. 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 Beautifully said. Any any other any other questions for George? Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, well, um, um, George, I, I, I think on behalf of everyone, we just want to thank you for leading us pleasure. into such a special presentation. You have wow. such a gift for interweaving uh, theology and psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, you had such beautiful and heavy words this evening, and uh, I think I think what you said is going to stay with us well beyond tonight. So thank you so much, wow. George. You're, you're thank welcome. You. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. And, and just when you guys say your prayers tonight, I really encourage that you kind of have that little meeting with the Lord on what you can, you know, the synergy of what you can work with the Lord when it comes to your thought life, whatever, whatever that's going to mean for you. That, that before you hit, hit the pillow, like, Lord, enter my heart but help me when I get in my head, like some kind of little agreement on whatever, whatever, however the mental bully shows up for you and whatever ways you've been robbed um, that you and the Lord would connect on that tonight and that your spiritual life would have everything about being attentive to letting the advocate help you be the advocate to Amen. when your little boy or little girl is getting beat up on that playground. Amen. Amen. Right. Right on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Right on. Thanks, thank guys. Thank you, George. And, and um, uh -huh. thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we hope we'll see you again in two weeks um, for February 11th when uh, Father Tom Sagalakis will be leading us for the next presentation. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God bless. Right you. Have a wonderful evening. God bless. Bye. God bless, guys. Thanks. Bye, you. Hi, you guys. Good seeing you all. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you.